and the big question um, going to be on that at the quarterback position Danell Hunter also hits free agency Kirk Cousins hits free agency of course um, they're trying to work out what's going to happen with Marcus Davenport remember last year Davenport was high on our our free agent board, he only gets the one-year deal from Minnesota. We called it a prove-it deal. Ends up getting hurt again. Did not prove it. Did not prove it. Uh, maybe they can get him back on the cheap. But let's, let's start at quarterback. What happens with Minnesota at the QB position? Yeah, this is like we've been kind of calling for this for years, right? They need to finally put a stop date to the Kirk Cousins thing because it's not, it's not going to take them where they need to go. They finally did. They were like, all right, no more re-upping of the deals. <laughs> And then Cousins gets hurt, you know, pops his Achilles, and the season without Cousins, or what what was left of the season without Cousins, kind of showed you how much Cousins was bringing to the table. Almost a reverse of the Mason Rudolph, uh, Tyrod Taylor dynamic, right? The absence of Kirk Cousins showed how much Kirk Cousins was doing for this offense. And if anything, he's been consistently playing his best football in this system. So now that you have Jordan Addison and Justin Jefferson, albeit he's going to need to get paid a lot soon, um, Addison? You're already paying Addison? Jefferson. Oh, Jefferson. I thought you, Okay, sorry. Um, like, do you say, actually, okay, it's not like you don't want to be paying Kirk Cousins top of the market money, but it, when your alternative is, okay, we don't have Kirk Cousins anymore, we pick 11, we're either drafting QB 3, 4, 5 at 11, or we're doing something really aggressive to go from 11 to 3 to 2. Do they just say, screw it, let's bring Cousins back? Yeah, I saw people talking about this recently, about the, the last era of the NFL versus the current era and where the quarterback depth in the last couple eras. And I, to me, it's clear as day. The last era that featured Brady, Manning, Rodgers, Breeze as clear elites at the top, and then a whole second tier of guys who are capable of winning the Super Bowl, I mean, I think it was clear as day that the era between, you know, say 2010 and 20 – was much stronger than it is right now. I mean, Josh Allen's great, and Joe Burrow and Lamar with Mahomes as the clear top. I mean, all those guys are great, and Jordan loves ascending or whatever. But like in the last decade, the previous decade or whatever, Matthew Stafford was not a top 10 quarterback in that era, I don't think. Kirk Cousins was on the outside looking in of top 10 quarterbacks in that era. They were in that era. I mean, now they're top six to eight guys. Right, but Cousins has just taken over from Matt Ryan as the inflection point, right? I get it, but Kirk Cousins still existed in that last era. No, I know. It wasn't, but he's he a better player now. Like, he's a better player now than he was early in his I career. Mean, you this could argue the... Stafford, too, but, but again, I think those guys weren't, um, you know, Cam Newton wasn't a top 10 quarterback, in my opinion, in his era. But this is what I think is fascinating about Kirk Cousins, is he's not the player that he was earlier in his career. When there was this debate, like Washington, what, dillied for three or four years, giving him these, like, one-year franchise tag. Like, but are he's always we sure? put up really good stats. They no, just no, I know. didn't believe I know. That, it was, that it was sustainable. But they dillied trying to figure out whether he was a good enough starting quarterback or not. The Vikings end up bringing him in, and he's, I think, gotten consistently better throughout his entire career in Minnesota, in part aided because things around him, like Kevin O'Connell comes in, then Justin Jefferson comes on the scene. Like, the, the dynamic around him has changed. But I think he's become a significantly better player throughout his time in Minnesota than he was uh, earlier in his career. It's not – I don't think it's the same conversation every year as it, has, as it you know, as, as people like to make it seem. It's not just – it's a different conversation every year because Cousins is different. And now it's even more complicated because he's coming off an Achilles at, what, 35, 36 years old. Um, it's a the, – you don't have the, the leverage anymore of having at least one more year locked up. You've, you put the stop date on it. You've exposed him to the marketplace. It's a very difficult conversation, I think. And the only thing I think that plays into Minnesota's favor if they want him back, which I don't know, is – Bill Belichick didn't go to Atlanta. So I think the draw of, of playing for Bill Belichick, for Kirk Cousins specifically, would have been immense. And he would have done a lot to go and play for Bill Belichick. With no Bill Belichick in the NFL, I think the Vikings hold all the advantages if they want him back relative to any other team that's going to throw money at him. So, you know, he is a guy who has settled in Minnesota. You know, the, he's he's set there everything's good for him in minnesota i think it would take a lot for another team say in atlanta 
to come in and try and poach him away. Now, a lot is not impossible. Like, there's absolutely a contract I'm sure they could throw in his direction that would make him do it. But I think all things being equal or even vaguely equal, I think you'd want to stay with the Vikings. Yeah, the point I was trying to make in all of this, Kirk Cousins improved a little bit, Matthew Stafford's improved, you could say Jared Goff's improved, but none of those guys were top 10 quarterbacks in the, in the last era. But now you could say that they are, and it's more palatable. You know, I think it's, it's more reasonable. Every time I see, when people say move on from the guy that keeps you in QB purgatory or that is QB 8 to 20, I always say, what's the alternative? And you laid out the alternative for the Vikings at 11. You know, is it, is it Bo Nix or Michael Penix? Is it J.J. McCarthy? Is, that's risky, obviously. If you're, if you're, um, if you're Kevin O'Connell or you're Kwesi trying to, you know, maintain your jobs over the next couple of years, that's risky trying to do that. Now, the trade-up is interesting. Right. They were allegedly trying to trade up last year for, you know, whether it was for Stroud or for Bryce Young. They were allegedly trying to get to two or three, right, to try to get one of those top quarterbacks, Anthony Richardson perhaps. You also have to wonder to what extent is their approach conditioned by the rest of the division now, which features a Detroit team that was in the NFC Championship game and almost won it, a Green Bay team that we're saying could be better than them next year because of all the youth that they've got across the board. Chicago is, is more of an X factor, but – like, do the Vikings look at that and say, we are in a division with at least one NFC contender, perhaps two? Does, does Kirk Cousins get us where we need to go, even if we're able to put the rest of the team back around him and give him that kind of money? Or do we have to try and take a big swing and change the dynamic at the top of the draft? Um, yeah, so I think, so I wonder if, if the injury for Cousins does make it a little bit easier to bring him back. Maybe it's a glorified one-year deal. And maybe you also take a stab at quarterback at 11. Maybe we do both. Maybe you bring in a you know, draft a J.J. McCarthy to sit yeah. behind Kirk Cousins. They've been a team connected with McCarthy a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm intrigued by McCarthy with the athleticism and the upside. Like, I think there is theoretical upside because there's a small sample size of him throwing the ball. Right? <laughs> well, also, you know, Jim Harbaugh said he's the number one player in the draft. There you go. Um, I saw – who is it? Uh, never mind. I saw somebody mention that, you know, if he was in a more throwing offense – we would be talking about Joe Burrow. Don't know if I'm there yet. Don't know if I'm there yet. But um, uh, the Vikings have eight picks, this uh, nine picks this year. Last year they only drafted six times. Those are the types of things that also come back to bite. I think that's why they had to get a market, you know, Marcus Davenport for one year and just kind of, you know, stitching that roster together. But it's also why it's difficult. Like if you're now projecting a move from number 11 to number two or three. That would be back-to-back -back years with very limited draft capital. We are running really low on impact draft capital yeah. to this team. And if you're talking about the analytically inclined GM, you would expect the opposite. You would expect more years of you know 10 to 15 picks and, and doing that a couple times in a row to, to get the roster back on track. Um, anyway, so I think they'll do what they can to bring Cousins back. Um, it just shows the alternatives are scary, man. Yeah. The alternatives of not having that guy are scary. And they can compete in the NFC North with Cousins throwing to Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson coming back healthy. Uh, full season with that group definitely can, it, can it, do it, some yeah. damage. It's funny because I think for the first time in a few years, I think the thing that makes the most sense for them is Cousins. And it's the one time where they've decided, essentially, they predetermined we're probably going to put a stop to that and go in a different direction. It's like... It's the first time where I think it actually makes more sense to continue with Cousins than to, to pivot and go in a different direction. I think, I think a lot of the problems with all of these things, like, look, we went back and we, we, we criticized the Packers at the time for drafting Jordan Love, and I think that was for two reasons. They were on the verge of being a Super Bowl contender with Aaron Rodgers, right. and then secondly, at the time, we didn't love Jordan Love, so mm -hmm. we criticized it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I made up my mind to never criticize any quarterback move because I that's how I usually believe. To never criticize no, any like quarterback. No, any, like any drafting of QBs in volume because you don't really know. Um, I think it's also fair to go back to the Packers and say, did they leave a potential Super Bowl on the table, what have you. The problem with put, uh, pushing things down the road is when you don't try to get a solution early, right? So this has the opportunity. The Vikings, I think, have the opportunity to say, Let's do this deal for, with Cousins. Let's do a glorified one-year deal if he'll take it. 
however that looks, one or two year deal. And let's draft the quarterback. Let's do it earlier rather than later. So we're not at this point where Cousins is gone and we have to draft a quarterback so our hand isn't forced. Let's do both at the same time. And then take that draft capital and because you're using one of them on a quarterback that might not see the field this year, you start to trade down and, and add the, the depth that this roster needs, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. It feels like, so when, you, when you've got a Kirk Cousins as your quarterback and you're always kind of trying to find the next quarterback, but you're never really in a position to do it, you know, like this is a bad year when Cousins didn't play for most of them and they're still only picking 11, right? Doesn't a team like that feel like they should be drafting a second or a third round quarterback every year? Yes. Like literally construct your draft strategy to have a second or third round pick extra every year so that you can dedicate it strictly to a quarterback because most of them will be Kellen Mond and that does you no good whatsoever, right? That's but every what... now and again, you'll find one that might be a reason to move on from Kirk Cousins. Absolutely. But they haven't. Like they've they've done very little of that and they instead they've been bringing in guys like Jaron Hall and it's like you know, you're never – you're That's almost, at least a draft pick. But, yeah, right, but, keep, like, but then the fifth keep round, doing it. you're almost never going to find the guy in the fifth, whereas in the second or third, you might stumble on one so every Spencer three years Rattler or whatever. And Kirk Cousins. Yeah. Right? I mean, but, yeah, you absolutely should. But I that, think now – That's my, when, when we go back to, like, my draft board thing. I'm going to talk for, like, not – there's about 70 non-QBs that I would draft. It. And then you sprinkle in the QBs with your extra yeah. draft picks, and now you've got a full draft class. But my point being now feels like a little late to be starting that as a strategy. Like, this should no, have been what be. they were doing from the second that Kirk Cousins was the quarterback is we know – like, from, from year – after, from year three onwards, right, from after the end of his second year starting, they should have been fairly acutely of the opinion that we probably need an upgrade over Kirk Cousins and what is our pathway to getting that. And the only way of doing that, because he's, he's good enough that you're going to win too many games, is I need to, find, I need to draft a second-round quarterback every year until I find one. And they didn't, ever. The one last thing. So defensive – the other thing about the Vikings here, you mentioned Justin Jefferson's going to have to get paid. Uh, Christian Darasaw is going to have to get paid yep. pretty soon as well. Um, Brad has Harrison Smith, the safety, the veteran safety, as a potential cut slash pay cut, really. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, did they run this extreme blitz-heavy, three-man rush-heavy scheme from Brian Flores out of necessity and yeah. lack of talent? That needs to be attacked, I think, from just a talent standpoint, top to bottom. And what is the evolution of that in year two. I mean, Brian Flores, I think, had a fairly strong assistant coach of the year candidacy for what he did with that defense, given the lack of talent around him. But late in the year, it did start to get found out a little bit. Teams worked out what was happening. Teams found ways of attacking it. And he sort of ran out of answers. Now, was that just a, an inevitable product of there's only so much talent here. There's only so many smoke and mirrors to go around. And over 17 games, eventually I run out of smoke and mirrors, right? Can he do it again? Like, is there, a, is there a second year evolution of the system? Or did he simply run out of smoke and mirrors? And now they're in trouble, with, like without a massive jump forward in terms of defensive personnel. So I think that's a huge question for that defense heading into this year is, look, it still doesn't have a lot of talent. They're losing more. You know, Donnell Hunter, guys like that are, are scheduled to hit free agency if they don't bring them back. So we either need a massive influx of defensive talent or the dude operating the, the smoke and mirrors needs to have a completely new set of smoke and mirrors that can last 17 games again. If the Vikings don't go QB at 11 or trade up or whatever it might be, uh, Jared Verse. I mean, I think, I think Edge has been linked to the Vikings in, uh, early in the draft quite a bit. Layatu Latu from UCLA. He's going to be one of our favorites. Jared Verse. To me, those are the top two edges, and I think it's pretty clear that those are the top two guys. Latu's lack of arm length or testing and injury history might come up as an issue. Uh, but I think those are the top two guys above uh, Dallas Turner in particular. I think those guys should absolutely be in play at 11 for Minnesota. Yeah, I would have no problem drafting Latu at 11. It will be, if they did it, it w I think a lot of people would scream reach, but I think that would be a great pick. I don't know. I'm, again, I, I try not to live in this world where I know what everybody else thinks. I just know that's, that seems right the, like, the, like the right value. If Latu ends up falling because of any sort of medical history or arm length or anything like that, man, if he's a steal in the mid to late first round or wherever he might fall. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, the defense getting attacked at pick 11 and 42 for Minnesota makes a lot of sense. That's all they have. 
in the top 100 or in the, in the top 50 or, or in the top 100. So I'm curious to know how much they are going to try to accumulate draft capital a year after last year they picked Addison in the first, didn't have a second. Yeah. Makai Blackman in the third, that's nice, but they had a four, two fives, and a seven. They only had six total picks last year. Not picking enough in the top 100 starts to really add up over yeah. years. So I mean, that means, sorry, two straight years they'll have – slotted three picks in the top 100 over a two-year period that makes it really difficult from a team building standpoint they have a few cornerstone pieces you know when you look at darisaw justin jefferson and you know jefferson like these guys are gonna get paid i mean they're both <laughs> reaching the end of the cheap money so they have a few cornerstone pieces in addison obviously last year uh but number one it's almost none of it is locked up long term and number two that's kind of it. Like nothing else is there to build around. I mean, they need, they need guys like like Ivan Pace Jr. was a fantastic a acquisition for them as an undrafted free agent linebacker last year. They need him to continue on that pace simply because they don't have anybody else. They need a guy like Mackay Blackman to step forward in year two and actually be a really good starting caliber corner because they basically don't have anybody else. Like the what it, what they were doing on the back end with Josh Metellus and Cameron Bynum and Harrison Smith, like they need those guys to stay. It, this is not a good looking roster top to bottom. Um, they got the most out of it last year. I think. I mean, I think, I think Kevin O'Connell's been a good coach. Brian Flores, you know, coached really well. But yeah, I think it's time to reset the personnel and it's it's got to be a year where they're either trading down and attacking draft picks or the or they're trying to solve the qb future uh the future of the qb position and and when you sort of picks. yeah like when you talk about you know roster construction and team building and where you allocate resources like tj hawkinson has been a great addition to this team he's done a really good job but he's now one of their best paid players like one of your biggest sums of money percentages of like roster is tied up in a tight end is that where you want the money well that's that's one of those they they got great value of the player but when you go and you say we're going to give up a second round pick right. for him it's it's with the it's what you're getting from him as the player plus the price tag i think overall they're probably happy with it but then a team like detroit who found uh hawkinson maybe a better version of hawkinson in the second round a year later in sam laporta is even happier, right? So it, it goes it goes both ways there. Mm -hmm. um, we gave the Vikings some options. <laughs> Fixed. <laughs>